Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. Most women are still having annual mammograms in spite of the fact that mammography harms more women than it helps. After an abnormal mammogram, breast biopsies are often recommended. We do about 1.6 million of them every year in the United States and how it's done is tissues are withdrawn from the breast with a needle or taken from a surgically removed growth for examination. Women are told that the results of the biopsy will confirm that they either do or do not have cancer. In the case of a biopsy of an already removed growth, the biopsy is supposed to reveal the type and severity of cancer. About 20% of biopsies show that women have cancer that requires treatment. This affects about 320,000 women every year. But a new study shows that the medical profession puts way too much stock in biopsies. Pathologists frequently misread the examples, or samples rather, leading to both overtreatment and undertreatment. This study included 115 American pathologists and 240 biopsy specimens. The diagnoses of these pathologists were matched against the diagnoses of three experts. The results were a little bit frightening, maybe a lot frightening actually. Pathologists were only able to differentiate between abnormal precancerous cells and normal cells half of the time. In other words, the results were about the same as what we would expect if we just started tossing coins, and that is according to the lead author of the study, Dr. Joanne Elmore. This means that some women are being treated for breast cancer who don't have it, while others are not receiving treatment who should. Pathologists diagnose normal tissue as cancerous 13% of the time. For ductal carcinoma in situ, 13% of the patients were diagnosed as being less serious than their cases really were, 3% were diagnosed with having invasive cancer when they weren't. Now we have 60,000 patients or women every year diagnosed with DCIS in the United States alone. There's not universal agreement that DCIS is really cancer, but even so, and we'll stay away from that debate here and focus on the core issue, 9,600 of those DCIS cases alone are clearly misdiagnosed. The issue is even worse when considering comments in an accompanying editorial which noted that the study included no information on patient long-term patient outcomes, which means that we don't even really have evidence that the experts were right. Mammography generates over $8 billion in revenue every year, billions more, and that's just in the United States, spent on biopsies, surgeries, follow-up treatment. And there's a great deal of uncertainty associated with all of this. There's not much hope that it's going to stop because there's just too much money in it. The only way to make it stop is to teach women to say no and to use mammography only for what it was really designed for. It's a great diagnostic tool when you have a palpable, palpable tumor. And for women who think, my gosh, if I'm not going to have a mammogram and biopsies and all this other stuff, what am I going to do? I think we just need to be honest with people, look them in the eye and say, look, we don't have an early diagnostic test that works for breast cancer. The death rate from breast cancer hasn't changed. And, and the, you know, we gotta stop talking about DCIS as if it's cancer. All those women would be alive five years later anyway. So the death rate from breast cancer hasn't changed since all of this. The only way you can prevent dying from breast cancer and reduce your risk is to eat well, exercise, and stay lean. So while we're on the topic of breast cancer, when most of the treatments, I mean, mammography is unreliable, the biopsies are unreliable, the chemotherapy is unreliable in most cases, and one of the reasons is that chemotherapy will shrink tumors eventually, uh, you know, almost always, but eventually cancer cells will become resistant to the treatment, and the cancer comes back with a vengeance. And I think we have all watched this phenomenon, I have, family and friends, where the tumors shrink, the cancer goes away, sometimes people are pronounced, pronounced in remission, and then the cancer grows back very quickly and, and people die. Well, one of the reasons for this is that tumors signal the development of additional blood vessels via a process called angiogenesis, and this is designed to help the tumors grow even bigger. This network of additional blood vessels, however, is abnormal. It doesn't provide oxygen to the cells in the tumor, and oxygen starvation lessens the effect of chemotherapy and radiation. A new study potentially offers a solution for this particular issue. Researchers at Duke Cancer Institute looked at the impact of exercise on breast cancer in mice and found that exercise improved the number and function of blood vessels around the tumor, and as a result, oxygen to the tumor site improved. Tumors shrank more when chemotherapy was administered to these mice than when given to sedentary mice. Tumor growth was slower. Tumor cell death was one and a half times higher in the animals that exercised. 
Also, the density of the small blood vessels was 60% higher and the vessels and the tumors functioned much more like normal than in the sedentary mice. The researchers also conducted a, an experiment that I thought was even more interesting that it involved assigning mice to four different groups. Sedentary, exercise alone, chemotherapy alone, or exercise in combination with chemotherapy. Tumor growth was definitely slower in mice that exercised and took chemo. But what was even more interesting was that there was no difference in tumor growth between the exercise only and the chemotherapy only group. In other words, exercise was as effective as chemotherapy for shrinking tumors or keeping them from getting bigger. Exercise, by the way, no negative side effects. At the very least, it should be added to the advice given to cancer patients. But there are several limitations. Doctors aren't taught to do this. They don't do it themselves to begin with. They're not taught in medical school to talk about exercise as a form of treatment for those conditions. And of course, they don't make money with this recommendation. I mean, we have to throw it out there and call it what it is. And uh, chemotherapy can bring hundreds of thousands of dollars of income into a practice. And I'm not saying that that motivates all doctors to prescribe it. But my gosh, it creates a conflict of interest we just should get rid of once and for all. Based on what we know about the relationship between diet and cancer, think what would happen if we started prescribing diet and exercise to cancer patients. I think the results of a study like this would be even more pronounced with diet and exercise combined. The problem with doing this, I mean, I wish we could do a study in humans like this, but it's considered unethical to withhold traditional treatment, whether it's effective or not, um, to, from patients who have cancer and do diet and exercise on their own. But patients, this is the good news, um, informed discussions can help patients to make this decision on their own. And that's the business we're in here at Wellness Forum Health, is to give patients options so that they can direct their health care because they're not getting these types of options and a laying out of the risks and benefits that's balanced from their traditional providers. All right, that's all for today and for the week. As always, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you next week with more news.